Hello watch enthusiasts and welcome to Watch Chronicler. Watches in the modern age are facing a new era of design. In the past, watch design was, make no mistake, no easy task if producing something with true staying power, but was also far more guided than it is today. Take a dress watch in the 1950s, which presented a level of opulence and luxury characteristic of that post-war period in, for instance, America, or dive watches which, as a consequence of their intended role, did not provide any additional ornamentation. Each design was produced based upon its intended environment, nothing more. Today, however, we inhabit a very different world of post-functionality for the watch. Today, Rolex Deep Sea inhabits the same boardroom as the Patek Philippe Calatrava. Should one, therefore, surmise that these two watches should be designed the same way? That is, of course, an extreme example, but the point stands that, today, designing a watch is no mean feat. Of course, many brands circumvent this issue by either repeating past designs, or completely resurrecting old models with the admittedly appealing touch of nostalgic whimsy. However, very few brands can produce a new design which is neither derivative nor totally wild. In short, very few brands can create a truly modern aesthetic in a still sensible timepiece. In today's episode, I'd like to look at watches which, in my opinion, present very elegant solutions to truly modern watch design. These are not timepieces which aim to look entirely different, but they are pieces which present design touches, elements and concepts which truly show a new era of design and are not dependent upon the past. Crucially, this video has absolutely nothing to do with watchmaking or movement choice, because here it's all about the face and not the trousers, so to speak. For the first part of this video, I think it's worthwhile to consider the dress watch. After all, as a genre, it holds a far older book of design cues than the sports watch in all its variations. Additionally, the dress watch has an immeasurably harder time with no provision to fall upon its key functionality for inspiration, when at base its key functionality is only to be agreeable to the eye and to the wrist. Most watches in this sector follow very well accepted past elements. Some, such as the Longines Conquest Heritage or Patek Philippe Calatrava 5196, reach for older counterparts for inspiration, whilst others, such as the Tissot Gentleman or Rolex Datejust, the modern versions at least, offer simplified versions of well accepted sports watch formats. Minimalism is also in this regard a fault, as commonly known fashion watches from Daniel Wellington and others simply remove all detailing to suit the maximum swathe achievable from the population, but this doesn't mean they're necessarily well designed. The Nomos Metro is an exception. Launched in 2014 to showcase Nomos's unique and important swing system, the first escapement which it itself had manufactured, the Metro was unlike anything else previously seen from this Saxon brand. You see, Glashütte has a rich history of watchmaking in Germany, yet in real terms has no particular design style. Larco produced pilot's watches designed essentially by government order in the mid-1930s, whilst Langer offers watches with a traditional German demeanour, but still nothing specialised to the area. For most of its history, Nomos has, and there isn't really any nice way to say this, poached its Bauhaus design from a set of watches produced in the 1930s by the likes of Stover, Junghans, and even Langer after the work of the Bauhaus School of Design. The Tangente, for instance, is virtually a facsimile of those 1930s watches from other manufacturers. With the Metro, however, we really do have something new. Departing from the sharp lines of most Nomos offerings, the Metro is modern Germany in a watch, and not an allusion to an interwar utopian dream composed of sharp edges and sobriety. The crown is softly shaped and given rows of minute rounded grips, whilst the hour markers are round, printed circles with usually an additional touch of colour. Meanwhile, the hands, traditionally blued of course, balance the legibility of long, wide examples with the precision and elegance of thinner counterparts in this syringe-esque configuration. Even the lugs, styled after wire lugs, signal the acceptance that a thin but strong leather strap doesn't need the hefty hardware required for a steel bracelet to look balanced. Topping the piece off is a power reserve indicator on certain models, without the geometrical certainty of most watches, which resolves what is, in my opinion, a very creative reimagining of a dress watch without the constraints of the past. Before we continue, please remember to like, subscribe and hit the bell icon to always know about our future videos here on YouTube, and follow us on Instagram to see all the latest content from Watch Chronicler. If you're enjoying the content here, don't forget to head over to watchchronicler.com to be able to access all our podcasts and articles and see a different side of the watches which we all love. The next genre which I'd like to address is the luxury dive watch, or at least the semi-formal dive watch. The dive watch, as we all know, is a stupendously successful genre at the moment, and makes an awful lot of sense. Of all watches, they suit the average modern man's lifestyle very well, 
as watch they can buy and enjoy every day of their life without too much worry. However, from the Omega Seamaster to the Rolex Submariner, almost all follow the design points of pieces of the 20th century. There are, of course, a few watches, though, which do genuinely shirk these hindrances. An example I can think of is the Oris Aquis, which, based on a continuing series of integrated bracelet, kettle-shaped Oris dive watches, is comprehensively new, although its connection to previous iterations, which have required serious work to make look modern, and the inherent lack of flexibility which such a design provides, make me turn away from it in some ways. A watch which has, however, emerged is from a brand which I'm very fond of, Formex, and their recent Reef dive watch. On paper, this watch shares a lot of its specifications with other successful modern dive watches. These include a 42mm diameter, a 300m water resistance, a unidirectional bezel with a ceramic insert, an anti-reflective sapphire crystal, and superluminova laden hands and dial. However, the difference is in the delivery. None of this watch is modelled from the past. The lugs are short and broad, whilst the crown is entirely contemporary, and is balanced by a protruding section on the opposite side of the case, reminiscent but certainly not the same in looks or functionality as models from Badek Philippe's history. Then take a look at the dial, with its own markers, hands and finish. It's entirely different without making a point of being unusual. Consider it a watch which you can read without any adaptation, but which still doesn't ape anything else you might have seen in the past. Finally, the bezel insert takes the hardness and wear of modern ceramics and uses them to provide a captivating, deeply engraved unit which uses finish to provide legibility, not printing or other ways of marking the surface. The reason, however, that this watch deserves a place in this video is that it fully understands the needs of a dive watch in the modern world. A squarer than usual aspect ratio gives comfort, whilst the flattened case back provides a perceived thickness of only 9.4mm, courtesy of a thinner Salita SW300 movement, based on the well-known and well-loved, as those who've seen my videos in the past will know, ETA2892A2. Crucially, Formex have also realised that, in real terms, neither a helium escape valve nor enormous depth rating are worth the inconvenience to most buyers. Already, as a package, you can see why the Reef makes such an easy choice here, without even mentioning the quick-release strap and bracelet, and its micro-adjustment clasp. But what if we put to one side the luster and obvious aesthetic appeal of the Formex Reef, and instead look to a serious, professional dive watch? Not to say, of course, that the Formex Reef isn't a professional dive watch, but certainly it isn't fully committed to that cause. Well, we would most likely find that most watches in this field are based on very, very old designs indeed. Now, you could, of course, put forward the argument that design is irrelevant here so long as the product actually works. Look at the loosely planted ocean-based Omega Seamaster which recently reached the bottom of Challenger Deep, the Rolex Deep Sea, or the Seiko Marine Master in all of its forms. All of these watches are very competent in their particular formats. However, Zinn, the German technical watchmaker, suggests a different option. Zinn's work with dive watches is no new development for the watch industry, with such well-known models as their 203 Extreme Temperature Diving Chronograph from 1999, or the well-known 809 with its floating markers, yet it's been in the 2000s that a truly coordinated collection was able to emerge. Within Zinn's U-series, their specialised dive watches, the brand takes a very minimalistic outlook, the inverse, you could say, of the enormous depth ratings they offer, ranging from 500 to 5,000 metres. The cases are simple, even spartan, with flattened flanks, crowns at 4 o'clock, and bezels designed not for looks, but to maximise grip whilst minimising the risk of damage. But then again, Zinn's U-series is hardly a new design, and is, in this regard, rather an oddity as, despite being launched in the very early 2000s, and receiving no real aesthetic facelift since, it remains very contemporary. Looking at the U1 or U50 models, the latter being the slimmer, more refined and less water-resistant counterpart, the design is at first perhaps too simple. The ever-present short lugs remain, with a large, easily gripped crown placed strategically to avoid the need to be guarded. The bezel, like the rest of the case, built from corrosion-resistant submarine steel, is hardened, an option available for the rest of the case, and is stunningly engineered whilst a matte black dial is impossible to better where legibility is concerned. Crucially, Zinn have entirely resisted the desire to provide ornamentation, from the fully painted hands to bead-blasted case, and the use of red for indications non-essential to general use underwater. These are a masterclass in functional, modern watch design. Looking over these watches, it's pretty obvious to see why they're a masterclass in functional, modern watch design, particularly in this technical field, and in many ways you could apply the lessons learnt from these watches to technical watches going far beyond simply dive watches. At higher levels, one does have to consider watches which, through modern design, have reformed the appearance of a brand or its public image. 
No such example, in my opinion, can approach the Bulgari Octo Finissimo. In its particular sector, one can reasonably argue that the Octo Finissimo was never going to be an original watch due to its reliance upon the luxury steel sports watch market supported by Audemars Piguet and Patek Philippe. However, in the context of the brand, I reckon this is a fine example of important modern design for a watch. You see, when the Octo was initially released in 2000, it was the product of the very same Gerald Genta as had redesigned the brand's image a number of decades earlier with the Bulgari Bulgari. Nevertheless, it also served to show that the simplistic, overtly and perhaps overly heavily branded image of this Italian house was no more and had given way to a new generation of style. Refined to the sharp, thin and popular Finissimo model, the Octo's design deserves serious recognition. Most commonly seen these days in matte titanium or brushed steel, as antidotes to the highly lustrous golden watches you perhaps expect from the brand, the Octo Finissimo is noteworthy because within the framework of its sharp geometrical components, one can begin to pick out the Roman architecture which is so central to the brand. Proportionally, the Octo Finissimo is also important because, unlike the Patek Philippe Nautilus, Audemars Piguet Royal Oak or Vacheron Constantin overseas, this watch doesn't exhibit the typical integrated bracelet, flat bezel and purely geometrical dial. In fact, it virtually spurns those particular design cues with a downplayed bezel with only a cameo of the geometry so prominent on those other watches seen in the octagon under the crystal and lugs which, whilst not even conventionally functional, scream their presence at each corner and disrupt the flow of the bracelet. Of course, much of the Octo Finissimo's appeal is found in its rather beautiful micro-rotor automatic movement, yet by the same token, this could be seen simply as the way to make this watch's alien yet wearable design reach such extreme thinness. When considering this timepiece, it remains important to remember that Bulgari, as we've seen in their most recent collaborations, are still able to produce witheringly dull and repetitive watches with little appeal beyond branding. Nevertheless, the Octo Finissimo is much more than that, given that with minimal design changes, it's been able to accommodate a myriad of complications for, in essence, the whole top end of this increasingly credible player in the arena of high horology. But what do you think of these watches? Do their designs work for you, or should they have lent more on preceding models? Whatever your thoughts, let me know in the comments section below. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like, share and subscribe, as it's exactly what keeps the episodes coming. Thank you very much for watching, this is Armon from WatchChronicle.com, out.